Perhaps you've been struggling with stomach cramps and gas and this feeling of just being bloated all the time. You have this fullness uh, in, your, in your chest and your stomach uh, that just sits there uh, when you've hardly had anything to eat. You're noticing that you're belching and you're burping more than you've ever done. You have this dry mouth and your significant other uh, doesn't want you to breathe on them because your breath is just awful. Well, if this sounds like you, you may have symptoms of an H. pylori infection as well as low stomach acid production. I'm Dr. Hagmeyer and I'm the clinic director here at drhagmeyer.com where we help people from all over the world find natural solutions to chronic health problems using functional medicine and lifestyle medicine. In today's video, I wanna cover some of the causes of H. pylori. I want to talk about how someone develops H. pylori, tips on how to prevent a reinfection with H. pylori, um, how H. pylori is detected, meaning the different kinds of tests that are available. Um, and, you know, the significance of H. pylori, you know, really why it matters, why you, if you have these symptoms, why you should be tested for it. So, according to the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, about 66% of the world's population is infected with H. pylori. That's more than one out of every two people. In developing the countries, those numbers actually go even higher, where upwards of 80% of adults and 10% of children likely have an H. pylori infection. So with it being this common, uh, you might be wondering, is H. pylori really a problem that you need to be concerned with? And I would say absolutely yes, and here's why. H. pylori infections usually lead to peptic ulcers, but the infection um, itself also develops into an ulcer. This can lead to even more serious complications. This might include things like internal bleeding, uh, where this peptic ulcer just eats away at the tissue and the lining of your, of your stomach. It's important to understand that H. pylori is an opportunistic bacterial infection. And what this means is that it spreads more rapidly in people that are immunocompromised, people whose immune systems are down, people like the elderly, people that have low stomach acid, people that have chronic, perhaps chronic health conditions, people that have autoimmune diseases. And so H. pylori can cause ulcers and it can exacerbate and flare up autoimmune diseases. And so H. pylori is really one of the number one causes of stomach cancer, all right? So that's why this is so important. So one of the keys to preventing H. pylori infection, as, real, as well as really just preventing a reinfection, is having a strong immune system, right? Contracting H. pylori can be something as simple as sharing a drink with someone who has an infection, sharing the same utensils uh, that, of, of someone who's already infected with H. pylori. Um, I had a patient years ago uh, who, who kept getting reinfected with H. pylori infections. Every three or four months, he would go back to his doctor and, um, again, have all the typical H. pylori symptoms. His doctor would prescribe him, you know, the typical H. pylori treatment, which is antibiotics and, and proton pump inhibitors. He'd feel better for a month or two or three, but then all the symptoms would come back. And this happened over and over and over again for quite some time. And it really wasn't until his wife actually started seeing me for several of her health problems uh, that she was experiencing that we also identified H. pylori in her. And so once we identified the H. pylori in the wife, it became clear that what was happening is, is that they were just reinfecting one another. So that's just something to think about uh, for all of you who are out there and you continue to have problems uh, with either H. pylori or those symptoms. Your spouse or your partner, your significant other, could be infecting you, even though their symptoms may not be as bad as yours. Now, who else do we see H. pylori infection in? So I'll tell you that because I work with many people who have chronic health problems, people that have undergone chemo, people that have undergone radiation, or people who struggle with thyroid disease and autoimmune disorders, lupus, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, we see H. pylori infection on a very frequent basis. These patients often have H. pylori overgrowth along with uh, things like low white blood cell count uh, on blood work that's, that's done, like a CBC. Uh, a couple of things that I, I really think are important for you to know ab about the stomach and about H. pylori. The first is, is that the stomach has a pH of about one to three, usually one to two. So what that means is that this acid is very caustic. It is very, very acidic. And it's acidic for a purpose, right? That H. pylori would normally be killed off or kept in control when that pH is, is within that one to two range. 
But the problem is, and again, this is something that we see over and over again, is that if you have been using um, over-the-counter medications or even proton pump inhibitors, or, you know, like I said, over-the-counters like Tums and Mylanta or uh, some of these other uh, acid-blocking medications, um, Prilosec, Prevacid, um, those kinds of things. Um, you've been on these proton pump inhibitors or you've been on antibiotics, you're going to be at greater risk for gut infections, right? Anytime you have low stomach acid production, you are creating this environment that is conducive to the overgrowth of bacteria, including H. pylori. Now, one of the things I often see with patients with thyroid disease and celiac disease and lupus and fibromyalgia is that their immune systems will often attack cells of the stomach called the parietal cells. And it's these parietal cells that produce and secrete and are involved in the production of stomach acid. So low stomach acid will lead to GERD and lead to acid reflux, lead to heartburn, uh, lead to this indigestion, lead to this acid regurgitation, lead to this difficulty swallowing, this chest pain, this discomfort, this cough, and even hoarseness. So if you have an autoimmune disease, uh, you're really not only at risk for other kinds of autoimmune disorders, but you're also at a greater risk of developing H. pylori as well as low stomach acid. Now, I don't tell you this to, to scare you and to make you live in fear, but rather that you are armed with information. You see, most doctors are not going to go through these things with you in the short 15, 20 minute appointment that you have with them. Doctors are in and out of their offices. They don't have time to get into this discussion and have this with you, nor do a really thorough case history with you to figure out what kinds of tests you need. So there are a couple ways that you can get H. pylori that, again, I want you to be aware of. Uh, because H. pylori can live in your saliva, not only can you pass this gift on from you know kissing, like I mentioned earlier, but also through oral sex. You become infected through food. You can become infected through uh, water that's been contaminated. You can be connect. You can be um, develop H. pylori through uh, fecal contamination. Okay, and so we don't want to often think about this, but fecal contamination is when your hand touches feces and or food and, and essentially what happens is your hand then touches your mouth and so again uh, that's something that I just want you to be aware of you know you want to make sure that you're doing a good job washing your hands especially when you go to public restrooms when you touch escalators when your hand touches doorknobs now I don't want you to walk around with you know with uh, you know like a uh, you know, disinfectant, you know, with knobs and things like that, you know, disinfecting knobs and things like that. But nevertheless, you, know, you do want to be aware of these things, especially if you know you already have this compromised immune system. So again, another tip would be to avoid those restroom hot air dryers, right? Opt for paper when you can. So again, here's what happens in our body when we have this bacteria and that, that we've just come in contact with, right? This bacteria does not like living in our in, in our very acidic environment. So it's very smart. And so what it does is it creates this enzyme. And this enzyme is designed to neutralize the acid in our stomach. And by doing so, this H. pylori just kind of burrows into the gut lining. It shuts down the acid-producing cells. It shuts down the parietal cells in the stomach. This leads to, again, that low stomach acid and that gastric atrophy that I've talked about in the last video. And that's again where these symptoms begin to show up. Remember earlier I said that we need to have a stomach uh, acid or, or you know, the pH of our stomach needs to be within the range of one to three. Well, it turns out that this pH of one to three is actually needed to help digest proteins and break down fats and absorb amino acids. It's needed to absorb vitamins and minerals and ionize those minerals like iron and magnesium and zinc. Uh, it's very important for folic acid and B vitamin uh, absorption. So again, if we can't absorb our vitamins, if we can't absorb our minerals, if we can't break down our fats and break down our proteins, it's only going to have a consequence to a variety of health problems that are rooted in these nutritional deficiencies, like things like osteoporosis, like immune system disorders, like asthma uh, and allergies and breathing problems, things like iron deficiency anemia, B12 anemia, restless leg, depression, fatigue, brain fog, anxiety, and many other health problems. So you see, this just has a snowball effect on the body. 
So here's where things really get interesting, right? The acid in our stomach also stimulates the release of bile from our gallbladder. Now, if you don't have a gallbladder, um, that bile is released from the liver. And so if you know that you have an H. pylori infection, I also want you to start thinking about the bigger picture, the bigger context of things. What kind of vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies and fatty acid imbalances do you also have? How are those um, contributing to your existing health problems? You know, what are the consequences of impaired absorption? So at a very minimum, what I recommend to patients, if you're watching this video today and you know you have this problem, I recommend at a very minimum taking a multivitamin, taking a multimineral, and supplementing your diet with essential fatty acids. So those, those fats like omega-3s, those omega-6s, and, and of course omega-9s as well. Gamma linolenic acid is another one. The last thing I want to cover in today's video is really how do you test for H. pylori? What kind of exam uh, really do you need? And so there's a couple different tests that I think are incredibly important. Some are obviously more clinically relevant. Some are more um, available uh, you know, to the public than others. Um, and so let's kind of talk just really what those look like. Let's review some of those. And so number one is really blood tests, right? Blood tests measure the immune system's response to this bacterium, to H. pylori. Your doctor may look at markers such as an IgA test, an IgG test, and an IgM. And basically what these are are antibodies against H. pylori. And so if you test positive for IgA or IgM, what that really indicates is that you have more of an active infection, more of an active um, overgrowth of this H. pylori. However, one thing I want you to know is that blood tests are not very reliable for H. pylori and they miss many cases. Um, there are two methods of testing that I, I really recommend, and, and these are going to be things like the H. pylori breath test, and in a few moments I'll get into what's called an H. pylori stool antigen test. As it relates to the H. pylori breath test, this is a test really, what's nice about this is it's very easy to do, um, but during this test you, you essentially you swallow a capsule, and this capsule contains urea. And if H. pylori is present in the stomach, this urea is broken down, uh, it's turned into carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide then travels to the lungs uh, where it's excreted and collected in a bag for breath, in, in a breath, okay? And the urea breath test is positive and then the isotope is detected. That essentially is a positive infection of H. pylori. That means you have an active infection that's going on. If the isotope is not found in the breath, the test results are, of course, negative for the infection. But the thing that I want to really stress here is it's very important to understand that uh, if you do have an H. pylori infection and you test positive, it's super important to actually retest uh, for that H. pylori using, again, that breath test. When H. pylori uh, is effectively treated or eradicated, the test, of course, changes from the positive isotope being present to one where the isotope is no longer found, it's negative, right? So that's one thing I really wanna emphasize uh, is really um, getting retested. And then as far as treatment goes, treatment is, is always very important because it really is a, is a right combination of, of different herbs taken for a right period of time. Sometimes uh, medications can be used, but very often you don't necessarily need to take uh, medication. You can use a variety of different antimicrobials to knock this infection down. But again, this is where testing becomes so important, okay? So I always recommend you work with a functional medicine doctor who can determine what are going to be the most appropriate tests for you, as well as really just help you understand what a treatment plan really should look like, one that's going to be specific and one that's gonna be tailored to your needs. This of course gives you the best chance at successfully removing H. pylori on the first go around, right? It also can prevent many of the nutritional deficiencies that we, we often see as complicating factors that can slow down healing. We know that traditional doctors often miss these. They, they tend to not focus on this. They tend to look at H. pylori infection as just something that just needs to be killed. Whereas in functional medicine, we're gonna kind of take a step back and we're gonna start investigating those causes as to why that H. pylori infection is there in the first place, okay? It does you very little good just to eradicate it if you don't change the terrain of the, of the gut and the terrain of the, of the microbiome uh, in many cases, and you just keep getting reinfected. Um, again, so those are some things to consider and things to, to think about. So there you go. Hope you liked today's video. If you suspect H. pylori and you need help with either testing and developing a treatment plan, visit my website, click on the Start Here button at the very, very top of the page. 
Um, like I said, whether you need help with implementing uh, a specific diet uh, to help your gut, heal your gut, or you want to dig into some of the other root causes really of why uh, you have the problems that you do, um, again, fill out a, a, a questionnaire on our website. If you visit uh, drhagmeyer.com, look for the start here button uh, in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, click on that button and then just follow the instructions. Uh, it'll take you through the, the steps that we, we typically go through for, for new patients. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, make sure you subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. Till next time, take care.